Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 19 in our continuing study of the Old Testament prophets. Our passage opens, Woe, O Ariel! And our biggest question is, what is this Ariel? Notice Ariel, the city where David once camped. Now, let me give you a spoiler alert. Ariel is going to be a term that's going to be used for Jerusalem. And I think that becomes fairly obvious as we read through this chapter. Uh, it's the place where David once camped. It's the, the place where the feasts were observed. It's the place where the sacrifices were made. That's Jerusalem. But why is it called Ariel? And what is the meaning of this name. Well, the, the name itself, Ariel, at first glance seems to be a compound word. Uh, Ari is the word for lion, and El, of course, El is short for Elohim, that is uh, the word for God. So you would just think lion of God. Uh, and, and again, at first glance, glance, this seems to be the case because we can remember how Judah is described in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 9. And Judah, the, the tribe in which Jerusalem is found, uh, Judah is a lion's whelp. And then when we get to the New Testament, we read about the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. And of course, that's a reference to Jesus. And so that all fits nicely until we take a closer look. You see, in Ezekiel chapter 43, beginning in, in verse 15, we have a reference to the altar hearth. <laughs> and it's clear from the context that Ezekiel is talking about the, uh, the temple and the items in and around the temple. And it comes out uh, in front of the temple, the altar hearth shall be four cubits, and from the altar hearth shall extend upward uh, four horns, and, and that's a clear reference to the, the large brazen altar that was out in front of the temple. And the term that's translated altar hearth is the same word here, Ariel. Ariel. And it goes on. Uh, it goes on to d further describe that altar. Verse 16, now the altar hearth shall be 12 cubits long by 12 cubits wide, square in its four sides. That was the, the altar that was out in front of the temple. And so, as we read here in Isaiah 29.1, Woe, O Ariel! Are we speaking Lion of God? Are we speaking uh, a picture of the altar hearth of God that was in the city? Is it perhaps sort of a, a double entendre? Is it, is it sort of speaking uh, both in, in, by way of a pun? Well, let's look at it. Let's see which one rises to the forefront in the context of this particular chapter. Whoa, oh, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped, add year to year, observe your feasts on schedule. What happened at the feast? Well, you had sacrifices on the altar. Verse 2, I will bring distress to Ariel, and she will be a city of lamenting and mourning and she will be like an Ariel to me. She will be like a lion of God to me, or she will be like an altar in which there is lamenting and mourning and burning and things that are consumed. You see, it's probably the latter that is primarily in view, where it is looking at Jerusalem that's going to see burning and, and sacrifice, and great lament and mourning. Verse 3, I will camp against you, encircling you, and I will set up siege works against you, and I will raise up battle towers against you. And what is being described here will take place. In fact, it's, it's described later on in Isaiah. When we come to Isaiah chapter 36 and 37, we see how Assyria came up against Jerusalem to lay siege towers against it and to try to bring down the city. Verse 4, then you will be brought low. From the earth you will speak. From the dust where you are prostrate, your words will come. Your voice will also be like that of a spirit from the, from the ground. And your speech will whisper from the dust. Jerusalem is going to be brought low. And you remember what happens. Uh, Jerusalem is almost destroyed. But then, but then Hezekiah, the king, goes before the presence of the Lord. And he takes this position of, of bowing down before God. 
of prostrating himself and saying, God, did you see what those Assyrians are saying and doing? And God comes to deliver the city. In verse 5, but the multitude of your enemies will become like fine dust. Now, you expect to read in the next verse that Jerusalem becomes like fine dust, that Jerusalem is destroyed. But instead, it's the enemies of Jerusalem who become like fine dust. And the multitude of the ruthless ones, like the chaff which blows away, and it will happen instantly, suddenly. Again, spoiler alert, we get to to Isaiah chapter 37. And the angel of the Lord comes, and the city is delivered. As, as the angel of the Lord comes against the city and, and takes them away, uh, takes the Assyrians out, and 185,000 Assyrians fall dead in the middle of the night. Verse 6, from the Lord of hosts, you will be punished with thunder and earthquake and loud noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a consuming fire. And the multitude of all the nations who wage war against Ariel, even all who wage war against her and her stronghold and who distress her, will be like a dream, a vision of the night. And notice how we go into this dream imagery. You know, we talk about the images sometimes in dreams, but notice uh, you come into the story of these, these almost surrealistic events that happen against Jerusalem. And suddenly you wake up and, and the Assyrian army is gone and it's packed up. <laughs> the survivors have packed up and returned to far off Assyria. Verse 8, it will be as when a hungry man dreams, and behold, he's eating. But when he awakens, his, hung- his hunger isn't satisfied. You know, you sit down, you, you, you just, you're dreaming, that you're eating a great meal, and, and you wake up, and, and your stomach, <laughs> wait a second, it's, not, it's still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he's drinking. But when he awakens, behold, he's faint, and his thirst is not quenched. Thus the multitude of all the nations will be who wage war against Mount Zion. It will be surrealistic. It will be unimaginable to come with all these armies against Jerusalem and and 185,000 Assyrians just drop dead in the middle of the night. Verse 9, be delayed and wait. Blind yourselves and be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. He has shut your eyes. And notice whose eyes are being shut. It's not the pagans out there. Now it's the prophets. The prophets have their eyes shut. And he has covered your heads. Who? The seers. That's just another word for the prophets. Verse 11, the entire vision will be to you like the words of a sealed book. Now, remember, when you read about book, they didn't have books that were bound on one end. So so think scroll, you know, uh, a sealed scroll, which when they give it to the one who was literate, saying, please read this, he says, I cannot, it, it's sealed, it's all shut up, I can't open it. Verse 12, then the book will be given to the one who is illiterate, saying, please read this, and he will say, I can't even read. God's plans are a mystery at this point, even to some of those prophets and, and some of those seers, of course, Isaiah is seeing, is seeing those plans, and he's describing them. Verse 13, Then the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. And notice it's describing, not the pagans out there, but the Jewish people, the ones who have the prophets, who have the seers, but their religion is only skin deep. Their religion only extends to ritual, not to reality. And notice their hearts are not in it. And because of that, therefore, verse 14, behold, I will once again deal with marvelously. Now, marvelously sounds like a good thing, and it's a good thing that it's God doing it, but the recipients might not think it's so wonderful. It's, it's, it's unusual. It's astonishing. I will do, deal marvelously with his people, wondrously marvelous, 
and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. And those who think they are so high and mighty and have God all figured out find out that that's not true at all. And so in verse 15, woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord and whose deeds are done in a dark place. And they say, who sees us or who knows us? They, they, they think that they can get away with a casual worship. And so he says, you, t- you turn things around. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That what is made would say to its maker, he did not make me, or what is formed say to him who formed it. He has no understanding. When you think you have God figured out, <laughs> you're like the clay telling the potter how pottery works. You're like the flea telling the dog how the dog works. In verse 17, is it not just is it not yet just a little while before Lebanon will be turned into a fertile field and the fertile field will be considered as a forest. Now this is just a little bit of a riddle because if you go to Lebanon and Lebanon is just to the north of of Israel, uh, the landscape changes quite a bit. It's it it's more mountainous and more rugged, and especially you have these big giant cedars of Lebanon. You have these entire forests, which are great for building ships, and that's why the Phoenicians turned into such good sailors. But one thing you don't have in Lebanon are fertile fields. You don't have farmlands. You have <laughs> you have tree lands. And notice, uh, Lebanon is going to be turned into a fertile field, and the fertile field, field, you had fertile fields down in, in Israel in places like the, the Valley of Jezreel. But notice, those are going to be turned into wild places. They'll be considered as a forest. And we're not talking about literal forests or literal fields. It's a picture, I'm going to suggest, of the people that live there. That is, those nasty, old, rugged, uh, hairy Gentiles that are up there in, in Lebanon, uh, unkept and, and, and unkosher, they're going to be turned into a fertile field. They're going to end up being something fruitful for the Lord. And by contrast, those people that are supposed to be God's people, that do have the rituals, but no reality, that do have the kosherness, but there's no cleansing on the inside, they're going to be treated by God as though they are wild and woolly and and unkept. When does this take place? Verse 18, on that day, the deaf will hear words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. And of course, when Jesus came, he literally gave hearing to the deaf. He literally gave sight to the blind. But in a more figurative way, that was a living picture of what he was doing and what what he was going to do in a larger sense as the gospel message, the good news of his death and burial and resurrection went out to the spiritually deaf, to the spiritually blind. It went to those who had not been able to read the words in the book previously. It went out to the Gentiles. And in many cases, not in all, but in many cases, those who had been people of the book, those who had been kosher, at least on the outside, in many cases, they rejected that. What does the Gospel of John say? He came to his own, but those who were his own did not believe him. And that's being prophesied here in Isaiah, that the deaf will hear the words of a book, and the eyes of the blind will see. Verse 19, the afflicted also will increase their gladness in the Lord. Here it is. And the needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. That's the requirement that that exists in order to come to the Lord. You must be needy. You must recognize your own need. You must confess your own sin. Realize your own unworthiness as you turn to the one who came to save. 
And so we conclude. We have Ariel, the lion of the tribe of Judah, yes. And Jesus was and is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he is also the other Ariel. He is also the place of sacrifice. The place where your sins were taken and made to go up in smoke because he paid the price on your behalf. He was the ultimate Ariel, the sacrifice for your sins. And as you trust in him, you find forgiveness and wholeness as you come into the presence of God.